place I want to talk about today is uh, the development and the working class in Latin America. And the main kind of point I want to get across is quite simple, really, and it's that when we look at a macroeconomic political process such as economic development, the working class, the workers, actually matter. Um, and this, and they matter in terms of the, the, think the um, their experiences of development, their experiences on the ground of these processes and the struggles and um, that tend to develop around their daily lives and how they then kind of shape outcomes, um, placing both limits on what can be done, but also open up opportunities that, uh, particularly in the case of the later on, potentially can be revolutionary. Um, so sort of brief overview of what we're going to talk about, and open up a very big macro level question of what is development, um, and then use uh, this to demonstrate how we can conceptually look to bring the working class, bring the workers back in to our understanding of these processes. Um, I'm then going to try and demonstrate that using a case study that's part of my own research um, on the Chilean textile industry between 1930 and 1970, uh, before looking at um, a uh, an event that occurred, or a process that occurred in 19, after 1972 in Chile, uh, called the Cordonismos Industriales, which were kind of these, these wide scale of factory occupations, uh, which I'll kind of describe uh, in more detail later. Okay, so what is development? I mean, there's millions of answers, there's millions of texts, millions of, of thousands of different ideas about how development works. I mean, it's different economic paradigms, it's a political paradigm, it's the role of the state, it's changes in institutions. It's a colonial project, it's dependency, it's, you know, it's a multitude of different answers to this question. But I think what underlies them all, and what I think needs to be taken out from this, is that development necessitates essentially transformation, necessitates change um, at a level of production, a level of exchange, and most importantly for this project, um, in the practice of work. Um, and as a change, as a transformation, necessarily this is, tra this is contested. And what I would argue is that, is that those who directly face these changes in the workplace that come to contest them most forcefully and most frequently. So these struggles at the point of production give meaning to the political protests against policies and firms that come to shape outcomes in development policy and you know, political economy in general. And um, they place both limits on particular trajectories that can be pursued, um, but also provide opportunities for alternatives. And this is the point where I think we need to bring the working class back in. We need to bring the workers back into our analysis. We need to look at how kind of disparate individuals that are here will mobilise around a set of ideas uh, based on their own experiences of work, their experience of changes in the economy, changes in their everyday lives, and how they come to mobilise, in, in this instance here, in the 1970s, in support of a radical socialist project for economic policy in Chile. So we're sort of conceptually here, and really, um, for, for a bit, not for too long. Um, my research essentially is focused on experiences of industrial development and of industrial works in Latin America. Um, there's obviously you know, there's different types of workers, different forms of organisation, but where my work comes um, to focus is on sort of industrial workers, both organised and unorganised, in small and large factories. Traditionally, work that looks at this kind of um, analysis, the role of labour in industrial development, tends to focus on trade unions and the power of trade unions as bodies that um, influence policy, influence politics. I would argue that we need to look beyond this. We need to recognise what trade unions are. They act as mediation between labour and between capital. Um, they are a representation of certain interests, but they're not representative of the necessary struggles that go on in the everyday lives of workers in and around these organisations. Also, they kind of are limited uh, in the sense that they have to mediate and act within an institutional framework to hold them to capital. So what I'd argue is it's the, um, we need to move our focus, we need to look at the politicisation of the struggles in work that give meaning to the actions of these representative organisations. So quite simply what I'm saying is that um, the motives, the justification for the action of the trade unions develops within um, the purpose of trade unions pursuing a particular wage uh, strategy, pursuing kind of protection for labour prices, comes from the everyday experiences, the struggles that workers uh, have to deal with as work, as production changes in a political economy. So what I'm arguing is that a focus on the workplace and the point of production, um, and point of production struggles, sorry, 
uh, shifts our focus onto the workers and the importance of their daily struggles. They experience as active social subjects, not merely as passive objects of change, but as active um, actors in this process, and then come, which they then come to contest uh, potentially as a class. I think this quite kind of um, captures the idea that I'm trying to push forward here about how conceptually we can bring the working class back into our understanding of things like economic development. I'm going to read out the full because I think it's really good. Um, and it says, it is necessary to consider the wage labourer insofar as she exists outside capital. It's time to rise above the level of the political economy of capital, which constitutes only a moment within an adequate totality. So essentially what that means um, is that when we look at a process like development, we're looking primarily at the pursuit of set of strategies and actions by capital, by one, that one side of the process. Um, we're looking at how capital seeks to overcome the barriers placed by labour, placed by various shortages of supply and so on. Uh, but we're looking fundamentally at the political economy of capital and how it overcomes barriers to its own process of expansion and accumulation. And I argue that what we also need to look at is how workers that experience this, these changes that are come to constitute these barriers also look to expand their own interests and expand against the barriers set for them by the process of capital accumulation and how this comes to function at particular times in history. And so I'm going to demonstrate this at one particular time in history by looking at the Chilean textile industry between the 1930s and 1970s, which was a period of very rapid industrial change in the country. Um, this will briefly set the context. Um, this was a very key economic sector in industrial development and a key example, example sorry, of worker militancy throughout the period. Um, essentially the way it was structured, it was highly fragmented in terms of perhaps a few very large firms surrounded by a network of very small um, local firms. But also ownership within that production network was highly concentrated. Um, we also see low level, very low levels of productivity um, in terms of output per machine and so on, and also very advanced technology for the time, um, with it, particularly within the larger batteries, and close relations with the state. So what we're seeing is that the kind of construction of a very kind of contradictory um, industrial sector. Um, there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of tensions, a lot of contradictions with it. Uh, in terms of its, the way it developed between the 1930s and 40s, textiles were the most dynamic sector, um, one of the most dynamic sectors in the country, uh, led the country out of depression. Um, but then came in the 1950s and 60s to experience stagnation and a growing decline in output and growth and so on. Uh, in terms of understanding how workers were represented at this time, um, the unions in uh, the textile industry are amongst the largest in the country. Obviously, we ignore the copper. I ignore it, but not the, uh, copper was the main sector with it, where unions were active, but in the textile industry, the unions were probably the largest industrial firm, um, unions within the cities. Uh, it tended to be centred on the company, so we have some very large unions, very large firms, but then some very small or non-existent unions in the smaller firms. Uh, and in terms of the politics of these organisations, there was significant tension that existed between the so-called yellow, the amarillo, the kind of the company unions, the unions who were seen as uh, representing the interests of the employers rather than the interests of the workers, and the uh, Communist Party, which exercised um, a significant degree of influence and at that time uh, was very radical. Um, so yeah, briefly, uh, before looking at how we can talk about the workers, how they influenced um, industrial development, I'm going to briefly say something about methodology. How how is it that we can access this historical, this very kind of uh, popular workers' history? Um, and the way I chose to do it last year in my field work was to look at the workers' press, the union press, the trade union newspapers. And there's an example here of one from 1936, kind of talking about. Um, union Federation, the need for Union Federation, how the workers in the textile industry can protect themselves um, in this sort of very early formation of the labour movement in the, in the industry. Um, as with any other method, there's a lot of problems. There are two main problems, I think, with using these newspapers. Um, the first derives from the issue of political bias. Uh, the Communist Party, as already mentioned, is very active within the labour movement in the textile industry. And, so, and was the main publisher until 1970 of these uh, of these new publications. So we saw the information that we're getting is coming is mediated through this lens of um, the Communist Party and its interests and its those who represented in Chile at the time. 
this problem is then compounded by the fact that there are quite a small, a relatively small number of these publications still in existence. Um, even at the time, they went through very short print runs; they're easily lost. Uh, various political changes, uh, for example, military coup in the 19, 1973, saw a lot of this information destroyed or hidden. Uh, so it's only kind of comes; it kind of gets very fragmented. Sort of, it's like, I mean, we had the one I showed earlier from the 1930s. There's another one from the like, mid 1940s, uh, the sort of issue. Um, so from the 1950s, then we see more from the 1970s. So you kind of gets very fragmented. You have to sort of dip in and out and try and trace the, the patterns that, as they um, as they develop. But I still think this provides a vital part of the historical record on a popular history uh, in the context of ongoing processes of change. It represents um, a side of history that we don't often come across in kind of mainstream historical narratives. Um, we have to we can kind of get information about the kind of you know. Um, what was going on the strikes, who was being financed, um, what employers were doing, stuff that isn't really, you know, we have to look a bit harder to find. Um, and as well as this representative kind of historical purpose, um, these newspapers offer kind of a historical subject, a subject of analysis in themselves. Uh, the main role of the works press is a linking of specific grievances in the workplace with kind of broader political demands of reforming and transforming society. So what we actually see is um, kind of get an insight into the way in which the grievances, so reporting grievances at the workplace, so the firings, um, excess use of discipline, and so on. Um, but then you can see how they were, these were linked to kind of broader political identity, political ideologies of the Communist Party, and so on. And how this kind of uh, process, kind of, well, sort of class formation, happened, and how this kind of identity and interests are, are developed. So yeah, to, to wrap this up on methodology, I think the Works Press is a very important tool. Uh, it plays both a role as representative and useful for us as historians, as social scientists, but also it, it kind of gives us an insight into the historical process in itself by being a kind of a formative um, tool. Okay, so now we look at how um, how this happened, how work has had an influence on develop the development of the Chilean textile industry in this period. Um, I mean, we see here. Let's see this. This we see. You know, how 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 is it? These guys came to mind. This is uh, an image of a strike in 1962. Uh, so one of the major tech, the Suma, uh, textile plant, one of the major plants in Chile. Um, and it's how these guys to mobilise around those ideas. Kind of, you see on the signs, it's kind of uh, freeing the um, return of the fired workers to their jobs and to like best throw the bosses out of the country. Um, so how these interests come together, how these things come together to, to transform and shape um, how it comes to economic development in the country uh, within this industry. Okay, so to trace what went on historically, you see from the 1930s the textile workers um, experienced increasing levels of organisation and growth both within the industry and within the labour movement itself. Um, the industry of growth occurs under state and under domestic capital. Um, but in this process, we see uh, when we look to what was being talked about in these places, there's tensions with the paternalistic style of um, managerial <coughs> styles of discipline that this imposed on the workforce, um, alongside more kind of conventional kind of economic uh, work experiences, such as the failures of match wages, inflation, uh, firings, and so on and so forth. Um, as these kind of grievances developed, we see kind of, they have persisted throughout the decades. Like you look at the stuff in the 1930s, the 1940s, and 50s, they're still talking about the same issues within the industry. Um, but what's in terms of forming these these grievances and taking them to the next level, making them political, making them into a political uh, movement against um, policy, against what's going on within the political economy, um, the communist affiliations of these workers during the 1940s were key. So we see the persistence of these factory floor grievances uh, being extended and given politi increasing political meaning, being applied to kind of recent concepts of anti-imperialism. Um, we see critiques of trade policy and how it affects the workers now. Why we talk, for example, about um, the sale of the export of wool being a problem because it's declining, uh, it's depriving workers of jobs within the wool weaving sector um, at the time. These quite, this kind of grievance, the 1930s and 40s period of growth, the 1950s and 60s, as I've already mentioned, was um, a period of stagnation. So we see the intensification of these grievances. More workers are being fired, 
Uh, employers are looking for ways to address issues of crisis. So we see an intensification of stagnation, but also there's government repression. And these are interpreted through these previous historical experiences of struggle. So the tensions that already arise, the tensions between worker and employer, um, and the um, political meaning that's given to these, um, are then applied to, for example, one of the main um, means by, by which the state and capital sought to address these crises were through rationalisation of production, increasing the productivity, the kind of modernisation strategies um, that saw more work basically implies a higher rate of exploitation and surface value extraction. And what we see in response is an increased mobilisation, growing mobilisation, increased strike activities um, targeted at, specifically at these strategies. And Peter Wynn's uh, book on the Yoruba factory, again one of the major textile groups in Chile at the time, talks about the implementation of um, Taylorism as a scientific management technique in the 1960s and how this was resisted by the workers on the ground, how attempts to um, increase uh, um, work rhythms, how to in, attempts to increase production per machine, limit the amount of work per machine, uh, limit shifts, limit breaks and so on, was contested as kind of um, as a factory floor grievance that was brought into a wider political discourse um, against kind of the way in which development was being pursued by the state. This is also reflected uh, on an increasing macro level by um, the example of Clyde Sachs, which was an American consultancy firm in 1958, which uh, was brought in by the Chilean government at the time to try to address crises such as these. Um, and as with any kind of American consultancy firm, suggested liberalisation, rationalisation of production. Uh, but there was, it was impossible to implement because of the tensions, the crises, and um, the continued and growing mobilisations within the country. So what I'm trying to is all this kind of this development of this uh, these struggles, the development of these mobilisations, the interpretation of what was going on within um, the economy at the time, was shaped around this kind of anomaly of what's, what's often called the anomaly of Chilean socialism. I think this picture I've got on the right here kind of captures that image, like we have on the right, obviously Che Guevara, and we all kind of know his politics. And the guy on the left is the founder in 1952, or one of the founders of the CUT, the Chilean Labour Federation, a guy called Rosario Bless, who um, was, had no political affiliation, that actually came from kind of Christian humanist background, uh, but came to lead the components kind of um, godlike figure within the uh, Chilean Labour movement. And what we see here is kind of the multiplicity of ideological influences that shape these historical experiences and give them political meaning. Um, and this then kind of had these very important implications for what was work next, which is where rather than provide limits and put place uh, barriers to the process of development and to pursue by capital, we actually see alternatives emerging out of these struggles, out of these identities, out of these ideologies. And this was um, what was called the Cordones Industriales, which were a series, uh, the literal translation is kind of industrial belts. And this was a series of factory occupations that occurred primarily in small factories uh, in the industrial districts that kind of ring Santiago. And these kind of industrial areas kind of represented um, kind of nascent kind of grassroots socialism in which workers controlled and administered production, administered exchange, and made decisions about how the economy would work for them. And this is kind of where we see kind of these opportunities for alternatives developing out of these struggles, developing out of these um, ideas of kind of this political economy of the working class rather than the political economy of the capital. Uh, just kind of put this into context, these have emerged uh, following the electoral victory of the UP over Salvador Allende's government in 1970, uh, whose one of the pillars of his economic policy was the nationalisation of key economic sectors, which included the major factories, um, Yoru, Samsumar, Ermas, and Said, the major economic factor, um, textile factories at the time. This nationalisation and the incorporation of these firms into the nationalised sector uh, inspired the seizure of a wide range of factories, uh, both in support of the government. Um, these were kind of primarily small factories, but they were nationalised in, um, they were occupied in conjunction with what, uh, the workers and the, and the unions within the larger factories. This received kind of a mixed reaction from government. Those on the left of the government obviously very supportive. Those of kind of the right of the, kind of the Communist Party at the time, the end himself, 
were, were critical of what was going on. They kind of saw it as taking the socialist project further than it was ready to go. Nevertheless, the movement gained increased momentum through 1972 and 1973. Uh, occupations increased. Um, Organisation of the occupations also increased. Uh, as a reaction, the right uh, reacted um, through sabotage and so on. Um, there was a famous uh, bosses strike in 1972, which involved uh, sort of paralysing through the truckers' unions of um, the sort of main roads in Chile. And, um, this then led to a consolidation of worker occupations and the formation, the kind of official formation of these Cordones and Peones alongside them. Uh, the Comandos Comunales, which were which extended this kind of grassroots form of organisation, grassroots form of politics, into the um, into the shanty towns uh, that surround, tended to surround these small factories. Um, I think you can't really get um, a grasp of the importance of what's going on in this move by reading about it, by me talking about it. So what I'm going to do now, um, there's a short, there's a, a lot of very long, very interesting documentary called The Battle for Chile, um, made by a Chilean doctor. Uh, documentary maker who, who sort of covers the period from 1970 to 1973 um, with a lot of first-hand interviews, on-the-ground interviews, and unfortunately it's in Spanish, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to play it in the background so you can see, get a feel for what it was like, but I'm going to talk over the top of it, um, so you're going to have to trust me that what I'm telling you is correct. Um, for those of you who do speak Spanish, it's really, it's all on YouTube, so you can watch the whole thing, but for those who don't, then yeah, I'm, your, I'm your mediator. So what we're seeing here is this mobilisation that I talk about the workers. They mobilised, um, well, they sort of like defence of their workers. This is one of the, of the unions here. Um, there were, you can't get a range of workers wearing, obviously, military students, they're marching. Um, these coincide with these occupations here of a smaller factory. Um, and they, they, they looked to kind of occupy, they evicted the owners based on um, kind of sabotage of production and so on, various sort of pseudo-legal um, processes went through to occupy and control these small-scale factories um, around the system, in conjunction, as I said before, with the large unions at Yoruba, some of the sort of large plants that are already part of the nationalised social sector. Primarily these were defensive occupations, as I said, they were defences against sabotage, against the black market, but as they went on, as they consolidated, um, as more people became involved with them, um, they came to coordinate production, coordinate exchange, and administer firms um, for themselves. Uh, various forms of production are what underwent here. That's um, there's one very interesting anecdote of uh, a firm that's producing furniture. Uh, it was always a luxury furniture production producing for the rich. Uh, and upon occupation in 1972, the workers met and decided rather than continue that form of production, they would produce. Uh, cheap furniture for, the, for their colleagues, their friends, their neighbours, for the local area. Uh, and so we see kind of this change in how we see development. So rather than kind of focusing on profits, looking for sort of social need, but producing furniture for the, the people who actually work within the factories. So we see this kind of transformation going on, and you see here um, kind of how these, these factories continue to run. Actually, a lot of the factories improved under these occupations. Um, particularly focusing on things like worker safety. Um, uh, yeah, worker safety, um, uh, health and safety and so on, and improving, uh, they're talking to textile factories about uh, ventilation, which obviously got a lot of cotton dust and that going around. You need good levels of ventilation. And these were of interest to the employers, but they were to the workers, and these were the kind of innovations that occurred. Uh, the sharing of trucks as kind of to the right truck, but there's a, a the right often destroyed the trucks to prevent the, the process of production exchange, but they were shared between the workers. Workers moved from one factory to another to ensure production, uh, so that, um, production targets were met. So we've seen improvement, a different way of, of doing development. Uh, so you have to look what's going on. Next. I 
okay, we see here the idea of sort of this process, this, this contradiction, well, not contradiction, but this kind of multiplicity of ideologies in the nationalism. The Chilean flag was always flowing everywhere, uh, along with very stark socialist messages about, you know, this, this country is occupied for the workers, by the workers. Um, you see the message there, and these constant mobilizations to sort of support and maintain this very combative stance um, as to how development can be different. One of the main innovations was kind of these um, political meetings where factories became a political space. They're no longer just a place of work, they were a political space in which uh, workers came together to make decisions, to make statements about how they thought development could happen, how they thought their economy could develop in a different way. Uh, and you've got to remember, this is all very nascent, all very new, it was cut short by the military coup in 1973, but it had this kind of potential, um, this energy within it, sort of, and it was, it was kind of a primarily, it was a worker-driven process. Um, this guy, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure who he is. Um, but yeah, as an extension of this, what we're seeing now is the meetings for the Commandos Cominales, which were this kind of shanty town uh, linked to the linked to the factories, there is extension, it was linked but kind of um, linked but separate from the Cordales Industriales, which were the factory occupations of the South and Native factories. Commandos Comunales were kind of these uh, defensive organizations set up to protect the interests of the poor in the shanty towns in and around these factories. Uh, including kind of work, but what you see was workers who were working in small factories were also living in the shanty towns. So you've got this organic link between the two organizations. Uh, with again the factories becoming the centre focal point in these spaces, becoming these political spaces around which um, new ideas could be shared and um, new processes could be developed. What needs to be remembered is this was kind of a, came from a very strong sense that it was uh, the workers driving this. There's a very strong sense of class consciousness um, and the articulation of growth and development strategies through and for the workers. Uh, political activists obviously play an important role, can't be denied, and actually the Communist Party are very often quick to criticise, uh, the kind of the right of the Communist Party were quick to criticise uh, these organisations, kind of the playthings of the student left, the playthings of kind of middle class activists, not workers' movements, but they were. There's very strong, you get the impression here that it, these were workers' mobilisations. Um, a real manifestation of working class power that contested and shaped um, new ideas for, for industrial development. But essentially, yeah, what I want to get across, um, just to very briefly conclude, is that when we're looking at development, we need to look at more than just the strategies of firms and policies of states. And to bring us back to the theoretical conceptual point that I was making at the beginning, we need to look at how uh, the daily struggles, the daily experiences of the changes that occur through these sort of macro processes of economic development, economic growth, economic change, are experienced on the ground and how they are then contested and how this contestation then develops its political momentum as it's reinterpreted, reappropriated around certain political ideas, political identities, and how this kind of both places limits on what can be done, but also can potentially offer revolutionary uh, alternative opportunities. Um.